Today we are going to talk about qualitative research. So I'm going to start with an overview just to give you a sense of kind of the various different options that are available. For me, qualitative work is like the most exciting stuff. So there's so many different nuances and things that you can pick and choose and you can design your own. Of course, there are processes that you follow that, that make it easy to use. Um, but it's certainly a much more open type of research than the statistical stuff that we've covered and it's open to a lot more interpretation and subjectivity. So that's maybe the kind of caution to be thinking about as we go through. So let's do that. So this is kind of how I would explain the difference between the two. So if you have free ice cream and you use counting statistics and you find out that one in 30 people take a free ice cream. But do you know why only one in 30 people take a free ice cream? So qualitative work is what gives you the why. So we can make lots of observations, but to try and piece them and link them together and really get that insight into the human psyche of behaviour and cognitive processing, qualitative stuff is where you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck really in terms of answering that why question and you can do that in so many different ways but it comes down to the fact that you're interacting with people and the thing that you're using qualitative research for is to get to the crux of people um so jeff bigham <laughs> has has this kind of saying um, he's a current professor at cmu but he has this saying that the two hardest problems in computer science are people and convincing computer scientists that the hardest problem in computer science is people. And that's because we, we often assume that people will behave the way we think they should or we expect them to and the way we would behave. I think it's quite challenging for people to put themselves in the shoes of another person. Often when it's a situation that maybe you're not a part of, you're not a part of that community and to try and draw inferences from what's happening. So the complexity of people is the challenge. And that's not a negative thing. It's just that that complexity is what adds all of those layers of, of challenge and issue to what it is you're trying to do. But if you can get through all those layers, it just can tell you so much. And how people use technology and how people behave with technology tells us so much about how we can design the next iteration of that. So this is where the key value for me comes from asking the why question. So this is a sample of some different methods. Um, there are separate videos for interviews and focus groups, um, but the idea being that an interview is typically a one-on-one -on -one thing um, we're very journalistic, perhaps, where you're asking questions and trying to get into people revealing their opinions or their preferences. Then focus groups, then, is when you get a group of people together and you may be asking a lot of the same questions, but it has some bonuses in that that group sometimes, when you have opposing points of view, it allows you to really get to the the basics of what's being asked because people will then respond to each other. So you become much more of a facilitator rather than an interviewer. It's also cheaper. So if I am paying uh, people for their time and I'm paying for their travel, that's the same kind of um, cost to me, whether I interview them or I have a focus group. But the cost to me of the, as a researcher is that now I only have to do it once rather than eight interviews. I can get eight people in one room. So that's one hour of my time versus eight. Um, and I also have less time in terms of transcribing and analysing because I'm only analysing one hour worth of content, not eight. But you can have some problems. And I guess with both of these things, so the common one is that the person that you're interviewing or that is part of your focus group tells you what they think you want to hear. 
So people will be less likely to be negative or critical of things that you put in front of them in a focus group, um, unless you create that kind of safe space for them to do that. You also run the risk of having people who are overly vocal, and so they kind of just take over that group. And the converse is true. You get people who don't really contribute, and that comes down to the skill of the facilitator to allow space for the conversation to happen but also to bring structure to make sure that people have adequate and equitable opportunities to contribute. So what you might do at an interview or focus group is you might simply ask questions. You might also ask uh, to demonstrate things. You might demonstrate things that are brand new. Uh, you might demonstrate adaptations to something that they already know about. Um, I've been in focus groups where I've asked people to bring things along uh, so let's say, for example, you are designing an alarm clock. Everyone has their own sense of what an alarm clock is. And I mean, now that's probably a phone, but certainly for the older generation, an actual physical alarm clock is still very much a thing. So when they all bring them, you can start to compare each other's alarm clock and it prompts little things in people's heads. Oh, I used to have one like that, but I put it in the bin because of this reason. And you really start to pick out the positives and negatives of design features. So... Having people do a task or observe a task is also very powerful within those settings. Um, surveys. Uh, surveys we will talk about in more depth, but it's the essential thing with surveys is having a good design. Um, how long is your survey? What type of questions do you ask? Um, and asking kind of closed yes-no questions is not good unless they are used as a funnel to ask more appropriate in-depth questions, more open questions. Um, making sure that your understanding of a question is the same as someone else's. And so I guess in all of these things, just like we did with the experimental stuff, is having a pilot to make sure that what you think is true. So this is a story for you about surveys. I had a survey where I was surveying graduating students. And I wanted to include students who had just graduated and students who had graduated a few years previously and maybe like a five year period. So I asked them, when which year did you graduate? <laughs> and the first evening I kind of, the survey was out, I looked online just to make sure that data was coming in and that it kind of looked sensible, there was no major problems. And for that question, what year did you graduate? A number of people had written fourth year because they had graduated in fourth year of uni as opposed to they graduated in 2018 or whatever. Uh, so <laughs> that, I mean, that was a quick edit that I could just put EG 2018 on the question, but it, it really called into question those responses that already existed that had the, the strange answer. Um, and that's not the participants' fault. That's that my question was ambiguous in a way that I didn't realise until um, it was out there and people started responding. So surveys will typically have some closed questions, which might be demographics, the funnel type questions. They might have uh, scale questions, so rate these things on a scale of 1 to 10. They might also have open questions, so describe a time when uh, you felt sad. Describe a time when you were frustrated by a website. These kind of things that are asking people to give a little bit more detail, a bit more kind of insight. The responses that you'll get for those questions are varied um, because some people will engage very clearly with the survey and they'll have the, the kind of ability to boil that down into a sensible format for you. Sometimes it's just a big wall of text. Sometimes you get two sentences and it's not really particularly helpful for you. Um, but there's benefits to asking for that because for the ones that you do get good answers, they're often very data rich and with lots of little things that you can pick apart. So surveys either online or face to face, which is kind of like someone standing at the entrance to a building surveying people when they enter or leave. That one is a bit more difficult because you've got the cost of the person You've got the willingness of someone to speak to another individual to complete the survey. You've got the kind of effect of trying to please that person again who's giving the survey. What sort of answer do they want from me? Uh, 
you typically see that kind of survey in retail, for example. Someone will stop you and ask about your experience in a shop, that kind of thing. Um, online surveys are certainly more popular. Things like uh, Google Forms. Uh, there's lots of various online Bristol surveys that now has a new name and it's Dundee hosts their own version, but there's lots of different professional survey tools that you can use. Typically the output will then come out as a spreadsheet and it's up to you how you, you work with that data. Uh, observations. Observations are super fun. Um, hopefully you all had fun doing an observation this week at some point, but the idea with an observation is that you're, you're recording what's going on with a person or a situation. Um, and I'm not going, really going to say too much about it because I want you to go in just with your own pre-existing idea of what an observation is. Um, but yeah, there is lots of discussion that we will have about observations later. Uh, diary studies is basically you ask someone to keep a diary and that can take various forms. It can be a prompt to them to say, hey, tell me this thing, fill it in your diary. Or you can just give someone a diary and ask them to record, for example, uh, we had a survey, where uh, a kind of diary type study, where we asked someone every day to recall an issue that they'd had with a visual impairment. Um, and that's basically kind of a free entry thing. Sometimes there are activities or worksheets that you're asking people to do, which are essentially ranking things. Please outline the steps that you go through when you arrive at the office. Um, and it's just gathering this very, very varied set of data that you can get. Um, case studies is kind of... Case studies can be a mixture of everything, but the idea is that it's a very small number of individuals or one setting that you're reporting. So the generalizability of that is obviously much lower than um, if I was with a more diverse population. So if I was doing a case study on a school, for example, I might be based in one classroom with one teacher and I'm reporting on everything that happened there and it's a case of you know, highlighting things that happen, not necessarily making judgments or linking them, but making that information available for others to then use. For example, if you can compare case studies to see whether it looks like there's a difference in different settings, um, but it's not an empirical comparison in any way. Ethnography is, I'd say, more of a methodology. Ethnography is kind of this overarching term where you become part of a culture. So I am not a hill walker. I had one terrible uh, walk up of Monroe once and it was uh, about 50% enjoyable and 50% horrific. And I decided that 50% enjoyable just was not high enough for me to do that again. Um, but let's say I'm interested in how hill walkers use technology. I could join a group of hill walkers, become part of their club, spend a few months climbing the hills with them, and generally getting a feel of, okay, what's the discussions that they're having? How are they making decisions? How do they actually do it? Is there one person who takes the lead? Does everyone chip in? What do they do once they come back off the hill with that data? Are they sharing it? Is that part of a community effect? So ethnography is kind of becoming part of a community in order to learn more about them. So that's probably a fairly small sample of each of those. You could talk for hours about each part, um, but hopefully that's enough for you to start to see or kind of make reasonable assumptions as to which method you might use for different situations, different groups of participants and so on. So once we've got all that data, whether it is, it's going to be various forms, it's going to be transcribed interviews, it's going to be um, survey Excel sheets, and to do that we use various different analyses. Um, grounded theory, if I start in the middle there, is a sense where you have repeated data points. So one day I'll have an observation, and then I might have an observation the next day, an hour each day, sitting in a classroom observing something. I might then have an interview with a teacher. I might have a survey of parents. So multiple data sources that I can pull together, but 
I don't really have a question. I don't have a research question that I'm trying to answer. I'm just finding out what's out there. So that's a very open thing and you kind of start to give data codes, so you start to build it up uh, kind of from the ground up almost. Thematic analysis is almost the opposite of that. So we're still using codes, we're still taking snippets, giving them a label, almost like a hashtag, and then combining all those hashtags together to make a higher level label and so on, higher level codes. Uh, but for thematic analysis, we already have a set idea of what we want to achieve. We want already know what the question is. So there are lots of different methods that you can use, including multiple participants working together, including um, kind of comparing results, not comparing results, how many does each person code, etc. But the difference is that in grounded theory, it's an open exploration, and in thematic analysis, you're working towards answering a question. Both of them are fairly intensive processes, and it can sometimes take days or weeks to work through data and come up with a sensible um, answer. So what you would end up with is like a thematic map or an affinity map, kind of like a mind map. Affinity diagramming is an express train through all of that. Uh, so what you do is you get people who have domain expertise and method expertise, so they're, they know about qualitative analysis, and you give them half of the data and then me and my research team will come and do the other half on top of that. So the bulk of that analysis or the initial stage of that analysis has been done by people who have domain expertise. So that's a nice bonus. It also saves a lot of time. Anytime I've done affinity diagramming, it's generally taken me within a day um, to get that done. So it's a very kind of cost effective, powerful method to use. And we will have a go at doing some of that when we meet in person. Some examples that you can go and have a look at in terms of these are just things that I've done that are qualitative. I have done some interviews for understanding in a user-centered design process. So I wanted the, I was working with kids and I wanted them to provide information. Uh, so we had, there's a, a thing with kids when you interview them, that idea that they want to please the interviewer is much stronger in children than it is in adults. Um, so what I did was I had kids interview each other. I gave them a little sheet and a little camera and they recorded the answers that they gave, um, which were, I think, a lot more honest and kind of free flowing than it would have been if me, a strange adult, had come in and done that. So that's a little adaptation that we've made to interviews. And then the second thing is that we had um, a survey and then a series of interviews which were conducted online via like... Um, Facebook Messenger, Twitter DMs, that sort of stuff. Um, and we were interested in how people with visual impairments use emoji. Um, so that one is actually super interesting and super recent. Um, so the idea that it's a nice link back actually to some of the accessibility stuff that you've been looking at. So if I have a screen reader and I take the um, first section, the first example tweet there, I've got all these emojis in the name they're laid out in a visual way, but that won't convey when a screen reader reads it out. So a lot of the kind of how people do it, how people feel that's all coming out in that paper and that's because of the methods that we used. So that should give you an overview. Um, have a look at the further information on focus groups and interviews and the rest of it will pick up in person when I see you next week. There will also be a video on analysis, which has just given you more insight into those different approaches that are being used. Um, and as I say, we'll do an affinity diagramming in person when I see you.